which is chapter 15 of the Gospel of Luke. So that's what we will be looking at. But before that, uh, as you're looking around the church, you see that uh, it is decorated for Holy Week because we are about to enter Holy Week. And so I have a, a little reflection for you that uh, about Holy Week that I have prepared. Uh, let me pull it up here. Uh, so this week that we are embarking on is called Holy. And so hopefully we can enter into it in a spirit of holiness and a mode of prayer. And so let's pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, for this time that we are able to have together a holy time when we delve into your word the word that is to nourish us and to help us allow that word to come into our lives as we pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil amen so it's already holy week starting this coming Sunday, we begin with Palm Sunday. And we are to enter into the mystery of our Lord's passion, death, and resurrection. In that, we enter into the mystery of our own life to learn that we too are called to enter into life through, through death. Life entered through death. Jesus entered life through death. He entered a new life through death. We too in this life have to learn the same thing, that we are called to enter life through death. That is to die in order to live. to first be buried in order to rise to newness of life, to die to our old life so as to enter into the new life of the Lord, to be born again. This, of course, requires that we face our demons, that we confront that which is keeping us dead, our addictions, whatever it is that is keeping you dead. Uh, when I was in the seminary, we had one of our professors, an older priest, and he said to all the seminarians, he says, don't you all know that before you are ordained a priest, you're going to have to have an operation. You're going to have to have surgery before you're ordained a priest, he said. And of course, everybody was thinking the same thing that many of you are thinking right now, you know, because your head's in the gutter, right? He says, yeah, you're going to have to be operated on. And every, so of course, you know, that gets our attention you know, a bunch of young men in their 20s being told that they're going to have to have surgery. <laughs> Got your attention too. And he says, yeah, before you're ordained, you're going to have your heart removed and a wallet will be placed in there. 
And we said, what is he talking about? And this is a very old, wise priest. And he says, think about it. What do priests talk about the most? Money. Mm-hmm. So often, church, and not just the Catholic church, but other churches, all you hear about is money. You got to give and give and give. In other churches, it's 10%. If you, I'm going to get myself in trouble with this one. I know that. I'm, I should, I really should not. I really, I, no, I really should not, but, but I will. If you look at, if you look at the bulletin, if you look at the bulletin, and when the bishop writes, what's all the letters from the bishop about? Money. This collection's coming up. So donate. I know I'm going to get myself in trouble with this comment, but well, I can, probably not because none of you are gossips, so, you know, you <laughs> it won't get out. <clears throat> but it's a real problem, and it's not just a problem for priests, but it's a problem for all our bishops, but it's a problem for all of us that we have had our hearts removed, the heart that we received when we're baptized, when we receive the new heart of God to become new creatures, a new person. We have received that heart with the gift of faith. And the world replaces that heart with a wallet. And we have a wallet heart, and in turn, a wallet mentality. When I tell families, you should have more kids, because it's not good for you just to have one or two children. It's not good. Children grow up better. It's proven, there have been studies, that when there are more kids, ki the children do better in families. Families are better when there's more children. You shouldn't just have one or two kids. Well, Father, are you going to come and take care of those kids for me? That is a wallet mentality. Are you going to pay the bills? Are you going to pay for their college? See, it's all about money. My children need uh, their own room, and so we only have three bedrooms. Before, kids used to share bedrooms. What's, what's wrong with that? What's wrong with learning to share? This is precisely what is happening with our Latino families, with our Hispanic families. When they come to the United States, they get that mentality. And so, they get operated on. They go to the doctor, and when they're giving birth to, say, their second child, the doctors right away will say, uh, let's fix you. Well, they don't say, let's fix you, but that's what they want to do, you know. They want to tie your tubes. We'll do that right away, you know, so that you won't have any more kids. And the church says that is evil. It's evil. Sterilizations are evil. We're not animals. We're human beings. You don't do things like that. You don't damage your body. And I tell the people, you know, I say, you know, you grew up in Mexico when you had 16 kids in the family. I, I lived in, with a family like that in Oaxaca. And they were the happiest family ever. And you were, you lived a happy life in Mexico with 16 kids. And your parents could feed you. 
all 16 of you. You're going to tell me that in the United States of America, you only can have one or two kids? That's because you have a wallet mentality, because of your wallet heart, because it's all about money. We can't. In the United States, you can't? Of course you can. You can't because you've limited yourself with the wallet mentality that you have. That it's all about giving your kids stuff. My kids need stuff. No, your kids don't need stuff. Your kids need love. They need more of you. They can share a room. They don't have to eat meat every single day. They don't need the best stuff. That is a wallet mentality. And that is also what is translated in all of us. I need more stuff. I need a bigger car. I need a bigger house. And hence, I have to work more. I talk about that all the time. That you shouldn't be working 10, 12 hours a day. You're not a horse. That's communism. A person is made for work. I've seen the results of that mentality and a, and a wallet heart. The Bible says we are made for God. When you're thinking you need more money, more money, more money, more stuff, more, you know, your bank account needs to keep growing, you have a wallet heart and a wallet mentality. You don't need more things. Your money won't make you happy. In fact, the Bible says money is the root of all evil. Remember that rich young man? He couldn't follow Jesus because he was so attached to his stuff. And the Bible says you cannot serve both God and mammon. Look that word up, mammon. What is that? It's money. In fact, in the Spanish translation of the Bible, it says it right there. No se puede servir a Dios y al dinero, Jesus said. Dinero. You all know that word. Dinero. Dinero. I'm pronouncing it in, in, in the American way. Dinero. Okay. Right. Mula. Okay. Right. You cannot serve both God and mammon. You can't. You have to choose one or the other. As Jesus said, you can't have two masters. You will fail one. You have to have one master, and our master is God. The more you have, the more you will want. Bible says that too. Man, the more he has, the more he will want. So you don't need more stuff. You don't need more money. You need more God, because only God makes human beings happy. When you have a wallet mentality, everything is about protecting your stuff. I can't take care of my baby. How am I going to make it? Hence, I go and I have an abortion. I can't have more children. Hence, I need to be on a birth control pill. And it's really interesting, you know, it's really interesting to me. Everybody dismisses what the church teaches, especially Catholics. You know, they say like 85% of Catholics dismiss the teaching of the church and the family, which is amazing to me because we live in this uh, world of organic food. Everybody's doing organic. Everything is organic. Isn't it? You know, everybody wants to eat organic, so you pay more for organic. So you have no... You want it, and all these uh, pe uh, hippies and all the, pe you, all the people who are into all the new stuff, you know, the, the new generation, and they're all into organic food. And so they want to eat organic, and yet they're taking hormones every single day into their body. That ain't organic. And it, it causes cancer. It's proven there are studies out there. Well, you won't hear about that in, in the Planned Parenthood infused society that we have. Where our, our minds are washed 
by organizations like Planned Parenthood that are absolutely evil. Evil. Look up the founder of Planned Parenthood. Absolutely evil woman, Margaret Sanger. She believed in all the stuff that the Nazis believed in. Like selection, you could choose, you know, that's what, they're, that's what we are heading towards, where you'll be able to choose, you know, uh, the sex of your baby. So, evil stuff, absolutely evil. Sterilizations. In my town in Poland, we had many, many women who wanted to have children and they couldn't because they were forced, they were forced to work in German farms during the Second World War. They were taken, they were Polish and they were taken and then they were brought to a German farmer and said, You're, you know, basically you became their servant you were in a forced labor situation. You weren't in a concentration camp, but you, you had to do forced labor. And the first thing they did is they sterilized all the women. That is absolute evil. Now they did that force, forcibly. And so many people today do it willingly because of the wallet mentality that we have. Get away from that. Get away from your wallet mentality. We need more God in our life. God makes us happy. You don't need more work, more stuff, more things. We just need more God in our life. And so in that sense, this is Holy Week where we have to die as Jesus died. We have to die. You have to die to your selfish self, to your worldly self, to your passions, whatever those things may be, your mentality, you know. You have to die and then you're born again to the new life. You have to rise as Jesus did. So whatever tomb you're in, the stone is removed and you will rise as Jesus did. To die to our old life so as to enter into the new life of the Lord, to be born again. This of course requires that we face our demons, that we confront that which is keeping you dead. So what is keeping you dead? Your addictions, maybe your depression, your low self-esteem, lack of forgiveness, grudges, resentment, past sins that God has already forgiven you for, but that you keep rehashing over and over again in your mind. Toxic people in your life. Yeah. If you have toxic people in your life, get rid of them. Because you have no obligation to allow anyone to abuse you or use you. And if you have people in your life that are using you or abusing you and or manipulating you, stop it. Don't allow anyone to abuse you or use you or manipulate you maybe that's why you're in a tomb maybe that's why you're dead in order to rise you have to want to rise see Jesus uh, he is the one who decided he was going to go into Holy Week he didn't want to. Remember that uh, we're going to hear about that during Holy Week. 
he says, Father, if, if, if you can, please let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but your will be done. And your will is that I enter Holy Week. And so he did. Because he threw himself in the hands of his Father. And that's what we have to do. We may not want to, but God knows why it's good for us to. So we throw ourselves into the hands of our loving Father and we say, Lord, I want to die with you so as to then rise again with you. Your lack of forgiveness, maybe a grudge or resentment that you feel, maybe that's what you have to face. Maybe your lack of patience or the fact that you gossip. If you're a gossiper, you're a terrorist. You just had somebody terrorizing people in Austin. Well, if you gossip, you are no better because you also throw bombs or set them off and then you wait for them to explode. So stop it. Gossipers are terrorists. If you are depressed and full of anxiety, you need to go see a doctor and get depression and anxiety medication. Medicine is a gift from God, so let's use it. None of this stuff. Well, God's going to take care of it. I don't need medicine for my depression, you say. I'm just going to pray more. God gave the, the medication for us to use it. If you're depressed, you need to go see your primary physician and say, Doctor, I need something. Maybe you need to change jobs because the employment you have is killing you or keeping you in a tomb. Not easy. But maybe that's what you need to do. So what, what, what is keeping you in that tomb? I'm looking for you to reflect on that at this time. Maybe you need to confront your spouse about your marriage situation where you finally say, I don't want to live in a tomb and it's time to get us get up and get us help. We have wonderful programs in the church. Retrovi for marriages that are on the rocks. Google Retrovi in Las Vegas or wherever you're at. There are, those programs are everywhere. Maybe you need to go to confession and confess your sins off of your soul. It's been keeping you in a tomb because you're afraid to go. Maybe you're in, in a tomb dead because you don't take care of your health, like being overweight and not exercising and not eating right. Like if you have diabetes and you eat whatever you want, and you continue to damage your body. So getting out of the tomb and rising means rising to the occasion of starting a diet program, like Weight Watchers, for example, and exercising. Maybe you're afraid, and the fear is keeping you in the tomb. You say, you know, Father, I know I'm in a tomb, and I want to get out of the tomb, but I'm afraid. Tell that to the Lord. He was afraid too, wasn't he? He understands that very well. In fact, you know, I want to bring to your attention the gospel from last Sunday that we have just heard. And the gospel from last Sunday is absolutely beautiful. And, it, and the most beautiful line in that gospel I will read it to you right now. It, <laughs> 
Some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip. This is John 12, 20 to 33. Some Greeks who had come to worship at the Passover feast came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and asked him, Sir, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew. Then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. And Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies. Are you hearing that? Unless it falls and dies, it remains just a grain of wheat. You're going to remain just the same unless you die, in other words. You've got to die in order to gain life. But if it dies, it produces much fruit. Understand that? The only way you're going to be a fruit-filled person in life, fruitful in your life, in or, the only way you're going to have life in your, in your life here is if you die. Dying to what? The world. Here's what he says. He says it right here. Whoever loves his life loses it. And whoever hates his life in this world will preserve it for eternal life. you got to hate the life of the world. The life of drugs, sex with anyone and everywhere, the life of addiction, the life of alcoholism. you got to hate the life of this world. you got to hate what? The wallet life. Uh-huh. Because that's the life of the world. And then you gain life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, there also will my servant be. The Father will honor whoever serves me. And here's the most beautiful line of this gospel passage. I am troubled now. What is the word, word trouble? in the Bible. The word trouble is really the word fear. Jesus is saying, I am afraid now. The word trouble, fear, is also a synonym in the Bible for the word temptation. That's why in the Our Father we say, lead us not into temptation. In other words, Lord, take the fear away from us. We don't want to because the number one temptation we have is to be afraid. That is our temptation. To fear that we are alone. Who was troubled? Jesus. Who was afraid? Jesus. And the, this, is, this is the Gethsemane moment. Jesus is afraid before going into Holy Week. He is afraid. He's full of fear. So if he's afraid, and he had no sin, you're afraid? It's normal to be afraid. Very normal. Over and over again, Jesus keeps saying, be not afraid. Be not troubled. Don't let your hearts be troubled. I just, I often think, you know, he says, the bird, look at the birds, you know, they don't work, and yet they've got everything. Your father provides for them, so how much more won't he provide for you? Why are you troubled, he says, so often, he says, you of little faith, and he, and the Bible is full of that. The, the, the phrase, do not be afraid or don't be troubled or fear not, appears 365 times in the Bible. 365 times. <sighs> do you think God is trying to tell us something? Yet, what should I say, Jesus says, Father, save me from this hour. But it was for this purpose that I came to this hour. 
Father, glorify your name. Instead of delving into your fear, delve into faith. Then a voice from heaven says, I have glorified it and will glorify it again. God brought his son because he allowed himself to be brought through Holy Week into the glory of the resurrection. And he will bring you if you delve into that. So what is it that you're afraid of, you know? Conquer those fears. Rise up. Remove that stone. Get out of the tomb. Wherever tomb you're in, in other words. Rise to the occasion. You know, God is saying to you today that He is with you and that you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. And Jesus tells you not to be afraid and to fear not. So you are going to get up and rise out of that tomb. I will rise up as Christ my Lord rose and I will leave the tomb. Now this takes great courage and the first step is always the hardest but God is with you and he will help you and I Father Adam am praying for you and we're praying for each other what more do you want and I know you can do it because all things are possible with God the Bible says all things when the devil says you can't, you're going to say, yes, I can, because I got Jesus. That's faith. So, you're going to risk nothing means you ain't going to gain nothing. You risk nothing, you gain nothing. So what do you have to lose? Do it. Make the leap of faith to really have an Easter where it's not just Christ who rises, but you who rise with him. There was once a man who had two sons. The younger one said to him, Father, give me my share of my inheritance. So the man divided his property between his two sons. After a few days, the younger son sold his part of the property and left home with the money. And left home with the money. He went to a country far away where he wasted his money in a life of debauchery, in reckless living with prostitutes. He spent everything he had. Then a severe famine spread over that country and he was left without a thing. So he went to work for one of the citizens of that country who sent him out to his farm to take care of the pigs. He wished he could fill himself with the bean pods that the pigs ate, but no one gave him anything to eat. At last, he came to his senses and said, All my father's hired workers have more than they can eat, and here I am about to starve. I will get up and go to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired workers. So he got up and started back to his father. He was still a long way from home when his father saw him. His heart was filled with pity and he ran, threw his arms around his son and kissed him. 
Father, the son said, I have sinned against God and against you. I am no longer fit to be called your son. But the father called his servants. Hurry, he said, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Then go and get the prized calf and kill it and let us celebrate with a feast. For this son of mine was dead, but now he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. And so the party began. In the meantime, the older son was out in the field on his way back. When he came close to the house, he heard the music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, What's going on here? Your brother has come back, the servants answered, and your father has killed the prized calf because he got him back safe and sound. The older brother was so angry that he would not go into the house. So his father came out and begged him to come in. But he spoke back to his father, Look, all these years I have worked for you like a slave, and I've never disobeyed your orders. What have you given me? Not even a goat for me to feast on with my friends but this son of yours wasted all your property on prostitutes and when he comes back home you killed the prize calf for him my son the father answered you are always here with me and everything I have is yours but we have to celebrate and be joy filled be happy because your brother was dead, but he is alive. He was lost, but now he has been found. Jesus tells this story as a response to the Pharisees. who complained that Jesus eats with sinners, that he keeps company with those who lead lives unbecoming of their call as human beings. It's not just Christians who are called to a moral life, a life away from sin. It's all human beings because it's good for us as human beings to lead moral lives. And they complained that Jesus would hang out with those who are sinners. And Jesus says over and over again, the healthy don't need a doctor. It's the sick who need a doctor. I have come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I haven't come for the righteous because they think they don't need me. They don't think they don't, they think they have it all together. I've come for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And in response to this attitude of the the, the hardness of their heart to the, in response to this harsh attitude questioning why Jesus would hang out with sinners he tells this story this beautiful heartwarming story of mercy of love and so the gospel tells us that Jesus addresses this parable to these people who are merciless. They have no mercy. He presents to us a God for whom the 1% matter the most. 
The God who leaves the 99 sheep and goes after the one lost one because for him that 1% matter. How often have you felt like that 1%? Well, you matter. You are just as important as the 99%. You are, n you are not the 1%. You are the whole percent for God. He doesn't view you as a one percent. For Him, you are everything. He gave His life for you. You. Just like you are. With all your baggage, all your sinfulness, your past, He died for you. As He did for the, the 99, He died for you. Just because somebody keeps the rules well doesn't mean they're more important to God than the ones who don't keep the rules well. The fact that you keep rules well doesn't make you any more special. It gives you more responsibility. You should want to keep the rules because it's good for you to keep the rules. It brings life to you keeping the rules. We get away from sin because it's good for us not to sin. It brings us health. Salvation. Not because it makes us better. I'm no better than any of you. The fact that I'm a priest doesn't make me any better or any special than any any more special than any of you. It just means I have more responsibility to try harder to be better. Well, I'm different than you because I have the sacrament of holy orders. I'm another Christ, the Altur Christus. The church teaches that the priest changes in their, their being. They're, they're ontologically changed. That's a theological word that will take a long explanation here, but it just means that you, there's a change that happens. You can't see it, but it does happen through the sacrament. So I'm different. I've got something that you don't. Like you have something I don't. We're all different. All of us. Doesn't make me any more special than any of you. Because I have a Roman collar. Oh, it actually. Oh, it's good. Oh, there it is. Now. After Jesus tells this parable, we hear in the scriptures that there is more rejoicing in heaven over one repentant sinner than over 99 righteous people. Now, where did the lost sheep lose herself? The Bible says, far. Far from where? From the shepherd. Far from God. Where did the coin get lost? The coin gets lost in the house. Ah, remember that? Or suppose a woman who has ten silver coins loses one of them. What does she do? She lights a lamp, sweeps her house, and looks carefully everywhere until she finds it. When she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says to them, I'm so happy. I found the coin I lost. Let us party. Let us celebrate. In the same way, I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. Ah, oh, that is the gospel, the good news. And where did the coin get lost? In the house. Hello? Just because you're here, not because you go to church, huh? It's because you go to confession or you pray. You can get lost. You know, how many priests have gotten lost, huh? And they're, right? You, you, you hear that on the news all the time. 
Huh? In big ways, get lost. Just because you're in the house don't mean you can't get lost. Mm -hmm. The minute you start thinking you're all that, you know, and I've got it all together, that's where the problems come in. None of us is a finished product. We are all works in progress. All of us. All of us. Priests, bishops, and laity. All of us. We are all works in progress and we can all get lost. But even though we can get lost, God is there to welcome us back because He's looking for us. That is the... You know, the more I get away from God, the more He comes closer to me. The more He searches for me. The more I get away from Him, the more He comes after me. Isn't that beautiful? The farther I go out, the more He's out behind me trying to get me. Absolutely. That is the joy of the gospel. While I'm lost, God is searching for me. Hmm. Where did the younger son get lost? In a far country. Where did the older son lose himself? Because he, he's just as lost. Where did he lose himself? In the house. Hello? Mm -hmm. so the sheep can get lost far or in the house Jesus is directing this message to the Pharisees and the scribes and the priests of his day where do they live? they live in the house Jesus is trying to tell us that we are not just able to get lost far away but we can get lost in the house as well, like the lost coin or the, or the older son through envy and jealousy. This message is not just for those who are far away from the house, but it is more importantly for those of us on the inside. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. You can get lost just as well outside as inside. The people who go to church all the time and keep the rules can get lost just as well as those who have no affiliation with church or religion whatsoever. You are just as much a sinner. The Bible says all men have sinned. We're all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God. That is why we, the church tells us we have to make a confession frequently. Frequently go to confession. Guidelines for Catholics in the reception of communion. It's on, on the inside of the missal. You haven't read it. I know you haven't. That's why I'm going to read it to you. Uh, I know you haven't. I know As Catholics, we fully participate in the celebration of the Eucharist when we receive Holy Communion. We are encouraged to receive communion devoutly and frequently. Thank you, Pope St. Pius X. What is my confirmation name and my confirmation saint? Mine, Father Adam. What is my confirmation? Saint Saint Pius X. Because before Pope Saint Pius X, there was no frequent communion in the church. He's a wonderful Pope. And that is my confirmation name is Pius. And my confirmation saint is because is Saint Pius X. Precisely because of that. Because I longed as a child to receive Holy Communion. And he encouraged frequent communion. And we should be going to communion frequently. 
but in order to be properly disposed to receive communion, participants should not be conscious of grave sin and normally should have fasted for one hour. A person who is conscious of grave sin is not to receive the body and blood of the Lord without prior sacramental confession, except for a grave reason where there is no opportunity for confession. In this case, the person is to be mindful of the obligation to make an act of perfect contrition, including the intention of confessing as soon as possible. A frequent reception of the sacrament of penance is encouraged for all. Don't let any priest tell you you shouldn't be going to confession often. Maybe they tell you that because they don't go often. Huh? The church's teaching says, a frequent reception of the sacrament of penance is encouraged for all should be going to confession often. How often? I'll leave that up to you. I try to go at least once a month. You don't think anything, most of you, of having a shower, let's say every couple of days or every three days, right? You don't think anything of showering every two, three days, right? I'm sure. When I was growing up, we used to have a bath once a week, whether we needed it or not. Let's bathe. How, how, how about thinking of giving our souls a shower? Huh? Get into that shower called the confessional. Confess all your sins. We do not know if the older son entered the party and joined the festivities. I hope he did. I, uh, I like to be hope-filled. You and I are this older son. You're here this morning. You're that older son. Huh? We so often want to exclude ourselves from the party by rejoicing with others at their return. All of this is talking about God's mercy. That's what we are celebrating during Holy Week and Easter. Mer the mercy of God. Many times you may feel insignificant or tiny. Who am I that the God of the universe should pay attention to me? God goes after the 1%. The 1% is not insignificant for God. The more you feel like the 1%, the more God runs after you. You are not insignificant. You have great worth and value for God. You are extremely special. To God, you are unique. The Nazis, and we, we, we went last November, I took... Uh, more than 30 people to Poland in a, we, on a pilgrimage and we went into the most infamous concentration camp, Auschwitz-Birkenau. We went there and when you entered there, what did the Nazis do? They put a number on you. You lost your name. And what is it that you hear when you're baptized? The first thing that the priest says to the parents bringing their child for baptism, we say, what name have you given your child? Name. We have a name. We are special. We are unique. You are not a number. You have a name. God loves each and every human being with the same love and care and concern. The nine are not more important than the one. God doesn't even let the younger son speak, does he? He embraces him, hugs him. He gives him all. God doesn't give us leftovers. He gives us his all. God is concerned for all. Now, it's really interesting. He doesn't even let the younger son speak. So often, so many of you, you know, you think that when you come into the confessional, that you, by, you have to say absolutely everything, the whole story. You know, 
where it happened, how it happened, with whom it happened. No, just say what happened. God already knows. It's, you're just voicing it out there. You're humbling yourself. You're getting it out. State your sin. God is equally concerned for all. He embraces the younger son, doesn't he? He hugs him. He gives him all. God doesn't give us leftovers. He gives us his all. Ah. God can forgive any sin as long as you have contrition, as long as you're sorry. There's nothing that is outside of God's mercy. Not one of us is outside of the mercy of God. You are not outside of the mercy of God. This story should really be called the story of the prodigal father. What does the word prodigal mean? It means you're, you're wasteful. You know, like you're, you give wastefully. Because this father gives lavishly, extravagantly, doesn't he? The father here is prodigal in terms of his love. He pours it out. He never tires of giving his love away. That is the God we have. The younger son's recklessness cannot deflect in any more cannot deflect it any more than the older son's righteousness. They are all family in the mind of the father, and a party for one is a party for all. The older son is here invited, not just to a relationship with his loving father, but with the wayward brother. It is an invitation to recognize his own lostness and the need to be found. You are lost got to be found. The story ends with the older brother standing outside listening to the party inside. And Jesus leaves it this way on purpose because it is up to each one of us to finish the story. You're going to join the party? Hello? Or are you going to stand outside? How do you stand outside of the party? When you remain in your sins. When you remain in the tomb. When you remain focusing on all the stuff you've done. But Father, you don't know I've committed an abortion. You've confessed it. God has forgiven you. I wasn't the best father or the best mother. But you're sorry. God has forgiven you. Look at all the stuff I've done in my past, you say. God has forgiven you. Focus on the mercy of God, on the forgiveness of God, that God has forgiven you. And get out of that tomb. Take that stone. Roll it back. Roll away the stone. Step out of the grave and into the life that God has prepared for you. Join the party, in other words. Are you willing to take your place at the table of the party with all the scoundrels that are there? In other words, all the sinners, all the reckless people? Well, are you willing to see all are you willing to see all people as your brothers and sisters equally deserving of the Father's love and mercy? and thus be united to each other only by the relationship to one loving Father who refuses to give us the love we deserve but cannot be prevented from giving us the love we need. He gives you the love you need, not the love you deserve. You don't deserve God's love. You're a sinner. You don't deserve God's love. 
God loves you because of God, not because of you. He loves us because of who He is, not because of who we are. He loves His Son because of who He is, not because of who His Son is. His Son went and lived a life of debauchery. But it's His nature to love His Son. Now the Bible here says He came to Himself. The young man is working for somebody who has him in a hog pen with pigs with no decent bed. He is working for people who do not care where he came from. He is disconnected from everybody who would want him to be better. He is in a far country, disconnected from those who love him, and he is now connected to people who want him to settle for being beneath his values. He's in a hog pen. What's in the hog pen? Manure. Huh? This means for him to change, he had to want it for himself because he's surrounded by people who want him to remain in the hog pen. There's nobody around him who would want it for him. Nobody. That's why you got to want it for yourself. The first step in Alcoholics Anonymous is what? You got to recognize that you have a problem and that you have to change. In any 12-step program, it's you who have to change. Don't pretend like people around you are going to bring the change into your life. You have to do the work. Sometimes we are all surrounded by people who want us to be satisfied by being beneath ourselves. Sometimes we are surrounded by people who would do whatever it takes to keep us from getting better because for us to get better would magnify their laziness. Or the people around you want you to remain in the hog pen because that means they can use you and abuse you and keep you like that. Because it serves their purpose. Don't allow that. If you're all constantly surrounded by people who all they want to do is take you to the casino so you can spend the money you don't have, may not be the best company. We have a saying in Polish, z jakim przestajesz, takim się stajesz. Z jakim przestajesz, takim się stajesz. I'm sure you're going to rem remember that. In Spanish, it's Dime con quien andas y te diré quien eres. Tell me the company that you keep and I'll tell you who you are. Isn't that peer pressure, you know? Huh? Maybe that's what you need to do. Huh? You got to be able to change for you despite of who doesn't want it for you. You have to want to change. You. People around you may want you all depressed because then they can use you and manipulate you better. But no! Some of us have people around us who don't want us to get better because the minute you get better you are no longer dependent on them and you are no longer addicted to their assistance. You are no longer defined by them. Some, sometimes, you know, the husband who has a wife that he can manipulate wants to keep her that way, all depressed and all down because, you know, that serves his purpose. You're going to say, no! Why? Because I came to myself. And that's what the Bible says the younger son did. He came to himself. You have to get to a point where you say, I don't need your approval. 
I don't need your approval. I'm looking for God's approval. I don't need your approval. I don't need your opinion. Because your opinion about me doesn't define me. The only opinion that counts is what God thinks of me. And as long as I'm convinced that God says I'm okay, that means I'm okay. I don't need your validation either. Because the only validation I'm looking for is the validation from on high. That is the validation. So, what happened to him? He came to himself. That's what I, you have to do. Say, I, I'm coming to myself. The Bible says, the boy said, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. He says, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. This does not mean I am not your son. That just because I have issues doesn't mean that changes my identity. Just because you're a sinner doesn't mean you are not a son of God. You are always God's son. You may not be worthy, and none of us is, to be God's child. But that doesn't change the fact that we are always his sons and daughters. That should be right now your aha moment. You know what aha moments are? They're the moments of grace. When God comes and hits us with his grace and we come to ourselves. That coming to ourselves is an aha moment. When I realize, no matter how much dirt I have on me, I am still his child. Ooh, that should, that should be good news for all of us here. No matter how much dirt you have, all the stuff you've done in your life, and you've done some pretty bad stuff. Mm -hmm. I know. And God knows. Well, no matter all the dirt you have, you are still his child. You are still his child. Uh-huh. You are still God's child. No matter what. The good news today is that no matter what your issues are, no matter what your struggles are, no matter what you have done and what you are going through, you are still his child. And he is still your father. He is still your daddy. Mm -hmm. He is still your daddy. And you are his child. You didn't know I, I had a southern accent, did you? You don't know that I'm from the south. I sure am, y'all. I sure am from the south of Poland. <laughs> You still belong to him. With all the dirt I have, I am still God's child. Now, we're getting to the end of this reflection today. I want to tell you something. That's why I started by telling you about the operation. See, everything, I, I tried to connect everything. Okay? So you have to follow. Okay? When did he come to himself? When he is broke, the Bible says. He is broke. What does that mean? He don't have no dinero. That's when he came to himself. He left home with a whole lot of money, but now he's got no money. He's got no money, but he's able to change. In other words, you don't need money to change or be better. Money can't make you who you are supposed to be. I don't have to be rich in order to get better. I don't have to be rich to be his child. I don't need to be rich in order for him to be my daddy. He always my daddy. Always. I'm his child broke or rich. So I don't care how much money you get. It can't make you who you are supposed to be. In other words, become a millionaire and you still won't know who you are until you know you are his child and he's your father. 
You, can't, you can be broke, but give Him glory and praise because you don't need money to know who you are. The boy is broke and broke, he says. I know who I am and I am better than this. I am better than this hog pin. I am better than living here in this hog pen, uh, uh, surrounded by pigs. How many people needed to lose everything in the casino? I've met many people. Many. They needed to lose everything in order to come to themselves. Even their homes. And then they came to themselves. Huh? How often does it take a sickness or a tragedy when you're broke. This is his moment of grace, his aha moment. How many people spend all their time in the mall trying to buy their identity? Huh? Are you trying to buy your identity? Because I'm going to be rich, you know, and that's going to give me my self-worth? Is that the attitude? How many people buy named brand thinking they will become somebody when in reality all named brand is an advertisement for someone else's creativity? Huh? You could go to the... You can go to the second-hand store and still have clothes. Make sure you wash them, okay? <laughs> In hot water. <laughs> how many people spend all their time figuring out how they will become rich in order to become somebody? When you are somebody right now, that should be great news right now. You are somebody right now. Right now. And right here, just the way you are, because you are God's child. He doesn't come to himself until he's broke. So sometimes God has to allow you to be broken in order for you to come to yourself. God doesn't break us. Life does. God is our loving Father. You wouldn't break your child. Life does. Life has broken you. God permits this brokenness to happen. Sometimes you are too high on yourself. In other words, my grandmother used to say, you know, you're smelling yourself. And because we took a bath once a week, it wasn't good smells. <laughs> So are you smelling yourself? You think more of yourself? You think you're the last Coca-Cola in the desert? So God says, I have to allow you to be broken for you to discover that I am the one you really need. Hmm? And what happened? The father felt compassion. We're getting towards the end of this reflection today of mercy, the Father's compassion. Think about that. The Father felt compassion. So he feels compassion for you. The text says, when the Father sees the Son coming, He runs to Him, doesn't He? He, he runs. The Bible says, He runs to Him. Because he feels compassion. Not compassion because he saw his son looking like a mess and he said, my poor son. No, compassion because of what is about to happen to the son. And this is the culmination. Always save the best for last. The culmination. The law in this culture said that if a son was coming home after disgracing his father, and he did, didn't he? He disgraced his father because he took half the inheritance and he wasted it on a life with prostitutes. Right? He disgraced his father. In fact, he asked for his father's death because when do you get your inheritance? When your father dies. So he, in fact, he came up to him and says, old man, I want you to die. 
so I can get your, your money, your dinero. And the law in this culture said he deserved to be stoned by the elders of the town. And that when the disgraced son would be coming back, the elders would gather around with stones and stone the boy to death. The elders would stone the son. So the boy is coming and the elders, you know, the, the Pharisees, the, the, the religious people, okay, the righteous, they're all lined up with stones. And the father sees him. That's why he runs. Because they were going to kill him by stoning him. So he runs to his son. He runs. And why does he turn around and say to the servants, quick, bring me a robe. Because he does what? He sees the boy coming and sees the elders lined up to stone him. And the Bible says he felt compassion. And he runs to protect his son. Which is why the Bible says he asks for the robe and he covers he covers his son. He puts the robe on him. He covered him. So that when the stones fell, when the stones fell, and the stones did fall, because that was the law. You think those righteous people, the elders, would have been detained by the father? Oh no. The law is the law. So the stones came and they were flying. And he's covered. The boy is covered. And when the stones fell, who did they hit? The father. The stones hit the father. He covered him. And the stones hit the father because he's covered he's covered I'm covered in other words I'm covered you are covered you are covered do you know why you ought to party today Rejoice today. Celebrate. Because every sin you committed should have had you stoned. Huh? Every mistake you made should have had you stoned. But the good news today is that God covered you so that nobody, nobody could stone you. put the robe on you. He covered you so that nobody could mess with you. You're covered. Don't allow anyone to mess with you. You're covered. He gave you a ring so that you would know you are royalty, heir to the promised kingdom of God. I know who I am because He covered me. And every time you see me, you can't see my dirt because he gave me a robe and all my stuff is underneath that robe. I'm covered because he covered me. He has covered me. God covered my sins, my mistakes, my errors, my bad thoughts, my bad attitudes, my wayward ways. God covered me. People don't know your dirt because it's behind your robe. That's why you should rejoice today. And that's why we say, what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus that covered me. That blood 
covered me, washed away all my sins. Amazing grace. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we thank you, Lord, for that grace that has covered us for we are covered. And because we are covered, we will have the courage to step out of those tombs, roll away the stone, and reclaim our identity as your children. Step out of that tomb and into the life that you have for us, a new life that you've given us because you love us. Not because of who we are, but you love us because of who we, of who you are. You love us because of you, not because of us. And so we glorify you today and always. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit come down on you and remain with you forever. Amen.